I thought I would just keep it light tonight and show a cute little movie that I have that's going to give you some, you know, just the basics about beekeeping. This movie is The Honey Files, A Bee's Life. It's um, a movie provided by the National Honey Board. nectar 
from a flower. They do this by inserting their, their tongue structure, which is really like a drinking straw. And they will suck up the nectar from a flower and they will store it in their little storage tank that they have uh, in their bodies. They will transport the nectar back to the colony where the nectar is then deposited into a honeycomb cell. The color and the flavor of the honey that the bees produce is determined by the flowers that they're working. Some honeys, such as sage and orange blossom, are very light and mild. Other honeys that the bees would make, like um, buckwheat, uh, eucalyptus we make here in California, avocado honey that we make here in California is very dark and, uh, and somewhat stronger. And again, it's all a product of the particular flower that the bees are working. When the bees bring the nectar back to the colony, it is first put into frames such as these. And when it is thickened up by the fanning action of the bees' wings, it is then capped by wax that's produced by the bees. Once we get frames and frames of honey such as this that fill many boxes, it's time to bring it back to the warehouse and take the honey out. The first job that needs to be done is to take off the wax cappings that the bees have placed on the cell, on the honeycomb cells. This is done by a machine we call the uncapper. The uncapper automatically removes the caps from the cells. After the uncapping machine has done its job, then the frames are placed into the extractor, which is a large centrifuge, which is it's like a big spinner that will spin the honey out of the frames. After the honey is extracted from the frames, we pump it into a large holding tank where we either fill 55 gallon drums or jars such as this. And it's ready for you to eat. Gene's family has been keeping bees for years. So can you guess what year the first man-made beehive was in use? When was the first man-made beehive in use? The first record of a man-made beehive showed up in Egyptian paintings in approximately 2500 BC. 4,500 years ago, the Egyptians had beehives. Tut, tut, tut. Well, unfortunately for the Egyptians, they didn't have suits like bees. And even though bees only sting when they're threatened, it's always good to be safe. That's why I'm wearing the suit. I'm not scared or nothing. I'm not. Well, anyway, let's go deep inside the beehive. Quiet, we're going into the nursery. deposits an egg into a wax cell. They change into a larva and are fed by nurse bees. They are fed a combination of nectar and pollen called bee bread. Soon they metamorphosize into a pupa, and soon after that, a new baby bee is born. And you know what the first thing is these baby bees do when they emerge? They clean up their room, which of course is their wax cell. Then they start feeding the larva. They're only two days old and they already have a full-time job as a babysitter. Unfortunately, the queen bee is kind of short on cash, so their pay comes in honey. They don't seem to mind. In fact, there are some people who get paid in honey. You know, we've already met a commercial beekeeper. Let's meet somebody who does it just for fun. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm from Belmar, Colorado. And some people might sail or fish for a hobby, but I keep bees. I got started in beekeeping about four years ago, and the reason I did is to help the pollination in my garden. I have fruit trees and a vegetable garden and lots of flowers and the bees really help that a lot. The one thing I've learned about bees is really they don't bother you if you don't bother them. As long as you're calm around them, uh, everything is just fine. You just have to be careful not to disturb their home or get too close to the hive. In the spring, I go in and check and just make sure the hives are in good shape, that they have lots of food and the queen's healthy. And then as the summer progresses and all the nectar's coming in, we just make sure that they have plenty of room to bring all that nectar in and start processing it into honey. And then in the fall is the fun part for us because we get to harvest the honey and we make sure that the bees are in good shape to start going into the winter. Well, the greatest fringe benefit of having bees is all that wonderful honey in the fall. Everyone loves to get honey. I love it. And it's also just nice to have them during the summer as a sort of a gardening companion, working in the garden with them. As a worker bee grows, her new job is the most important one, finding flowers with a sweet liquid called nectar and bringing it back to the hive to turn into honey. When a bee lands on a flower, she thrusts her head deep into the flower and uses her proboscis to suck out the sweet nectar. 
the proboscis has three parts that come together to form a straw-like tube. Because flowers have pollen all over them and bees have little hairy bodies and don't own electric shavers, they get covered with it. This isn't an accident. Bees make sure they have plenty of pollen to take back to the hive by storing some in their back legs called pollen baskets. She will fly from flower to flower doing the same thing until she's loaded like a cargo helicopter. She then flies back to the hive, drops off the nectar and the pollen, and goes back out for another run. Take a guess. How many flowers need to be visited by the beehive to create just one pound of honey? Bees have to visit approximately two million flowers to create just one pound of honey. Kind of makes you feel guilty, doesn't it? Nah. Oh, you're probably wondering how the bees found those two million flowers that made this jar of honey. You're not going to believe this. It may look like bees are flying erratically through the sky in a search for flowers, but they're not. They've been told exactly where to go by other bees. Many beekeepers had noticed bees acting strangely when they returned to the hive, but it wasn't until the 1920s that an Austrian professor figured it out. It's called the bee dance. The first dance is called the round dance. If flowers are close to the hive, a bee will walk in a circle on a frame just inside the hive, then it will stop and walk in a circle in the other direction until other bees join her and rub up against her, getting the scent of the nectar they're looking for. When the bees leave the hive, they will fly in a circle around the beehive until finding the flowers. The next dance is called the waggle dance. This is done when the nectar is found farther away from the hive. If the flowers are found in the direction of the sun, the bee will waggle straight up and down. If the nectar is to the right of the sun, she will waggle to the right. And if the flowers are to the left of the sun, she will waggle to the left. So even though bees can't talk, they can communicate in many different ways. Although I don't recommend doing this in public because nobody knows what you're doing. Where did you say that cover was? Oh, What fraction of the human diet is benefited by insect pollination? One one hundred, one tenth, one third, or all of it? The answer? Every third bite of food you eat is benefited by insect pollination. So the answer is one third. Why? Because not only do bees make honey, but they pollinate almond blossoms to give us more almonds. Not to mention apples, blueberries, cherries, cranberries, plums, squash, watermelon, zucchini and many crops like alfalfa that help to feed farm animals. That's why every third bite of food you eat is benefited by insect pollination. So what makes up the other two bites of my diet? Powdered sugar donuts. So let's see how pollination really works. For a flower to create a seed, it needs the pollen from a different flower. Since flowers can't move around on their own, except in some scary dreams I've had, the only way to get that pollen is to hope that the wind blows hard or a bee or another insect covered in pollen lands on it looking for nectar or pollen. So a bee will fly over to this flower, <coughs> sorry, and then we'll get all covered up in pollen and then fly over to this flower. <laughs> but what happens when an area is short on bees? Well, that's where this guy comes in. Hi, my name is Bob. I'm a migratory beekeeper. I run approximately 5,000 hives, with each hive having approximately 40,000 bees in it. Uh, many crops need bees. I move my bees wherever they're needed. For pollination purposes in California, we move the bees to almonds and melons. After pollinating crops in California, we load the bees and move them to North Dakota for honey production. Uh, we produce honey off of clover and alfalfa. How much surplus honey do bees make in an average hive? Here's a hint. It's somewhere between one teaspoon and 100 pounds. And here's the answer. Bees make approximately 80 pounds of surplus honey in an average hive. So let's figure this out. If on average, bees make 80 pounds of surplus honey, and it takes 2 million flowers to make just one pound of honey, and there's 30,000 bees per colony, each one making in their lifetime 1 12th of a teaspoon of honey, then Okay, they live 45 days long, so, okay, you've got 30,000 bees, and they're making, okay, one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in their lifetime, and there's 200,000 beekeepers, and I don't even have a teaspoon, and Houston, I have a problem. Okay, there's 80 pounds for surplus honey, and, okay, uh, what, what was it? Brain hurting, brain hurting. Not just people and bees like honey. Wasps, hornets, and other insects love it, too, and they will try to steal it. 
Unfortunately for them, they can't get past the guard bee. This line of defense protects against anything that tries to enter, even bees from other hives. Bees communicate with pheromones, and each bee has the scent of the hive. The guard bees smell anything that tries to come into the hive with their antenna, and if something doesn't smell right, there'll be trouble. Big trouble. <laughs> now, guard bees, or honeybees for that matter, won't attack or sting you unless they feel threatened. So when you hear that buzzing around your head, they're not mad at you, they're not going to sting you, they're just flapping their wings. Now, take a guess. How many times per minute are honeybees flapping their wings? The answer, bees flap their wings more than 11,000 times per minute. Wait a minute, that's uh, 183 times per second. Wow. Okay, let's try a little experiment. I'll time one second. You at home count to 183. Ready? And go. Time. Did you do it? No? Okay, let's try it again. Ready? And go. Time. How far did you get? Ready? Just one more time. Ready? And go. Time. <laughs> Those wings come in handy because one job a worker bee has in its lifetime is to cool the hive. They flap their wings at the entrance to the hive and blow cool air in the front door. That's better than my house. Actually, another thing about the bee's house is that you can eat it, or at least part of it. Comb honey is the ready-to-eat honey in the bee's wax comb. Also, people use beeswax and other part of a beehive to make a ton of different products. There's enough different things that bees and honey can do. You can have a full-time cable network. Gee, I wonder what that would be like. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. It's the Honey Network. 24 hours a day of bees and honey, honey, honey. And now, a word from our sponsor. What's that? Can't get enough honey products? Well, come on down to Honest Buzz's Honey Barn of Honey. We have so much honey, it's in our name flies. And we have the best beers in town. We have soaps made of honey. We have cough syrups made of honey. We have barbecue sauce made of honey. We have salad dressing made of honey. We have honey made of honey. We put that there. We have cereals made of honey. And we have stuffed berries made of honey. We also have beef products. We have mustard made of honey. We have yogurt made of honey. We even have bath gel made of honey. I don't even know what that is, but it's made of honey. And if we don't have the best beers in town, you can have my store. If you just tune into the Itchy Sticky Bones, you're making a fantastic recipe is just delicious. Here's how you make it. First, we take a banana and we shove it stick into it. We just do it just like this. We just slowly push it up. There we go. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pour this honey bear with honey all over our banana. Oh, it's coming out so quickly there. And remember to be very careful when you're looking at honey as it can be very sticky. So what we're going to do now is spread the honey all over our banana with the knife. And of course, now have you used lighter honey We'd have a milder, genteel flavor, a darker honey, and give us a more robust, older flavor. Again, be careful when working with honey, it can be very sticky. Now, what you're going to do now, the thick closure here is you're going to put the banana in almonds. Of course, almonds pollinated by bees, so you just roll it right through the almonds, like so. Just smash those almonds on there, be aggressive, be aggressive, they will stick very nicely. And when you're done, you have this. Lovely dessert. Oh, it looks like it just looks marvelous. And of course, it's called a banana. A banana soup. It's a banana rolled in honey and almonds. Bon appetit. Let's continue with our experiment on the science of honey. Today, we will learn how to turn crystallized honey into smooth honey. In many countries, finely crystallized honey is called whipped honey and is spread right onto food such as this one. Sometimes people throw out an entire jar of honey just because it is a little bit crystallized or is a little cloudy, such as this one. Oh dear, not acceptable, not acceptable at all. <clears throat> When you go home today, if you have a crystallized jar of honey, what you need to do is remove the lid. <coughs> remove the lid, place it on the table, and put the honey in a container of very warm water. Not boiling, very warm water. And slowly but surely, the crystals will dissolve and when you remove the honey from the container, the honey will be smooth. The science of honey. <clears throat> Amazing! Maybe a 
honey network isn't such a great idea. But eating honey is, it gives you quick energy, which is why a lot of long distance runners use it. It has vitamins that we need and antioxidants, which help fight certain diseases. But remember, babies under one year old are not allowed to have honey. So there's one thing you don't have to share with your baby sister. Well, I hope you learned a lot today. I learned that we need pollination because we definitely need food and we definitely need honeybees. In fact, you may want to check out the Honey Board website at www.honey.com. And if you can't check out the website, you may want to give them a buzz. Or I guess you could make a beeline over to their office. Well, whatever you do, you don't want to bug them. And, well, thanks for watching. I'll be seeing you. See you later, pollinator. What, 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 what? are busy feeding us, organizations like the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, a collaborative body of over 140 organizations, works for the protection of pollinators across Mexico, Canada, and the United States. What are pollinators, and why should you care? Pollinators are bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other animals which feed from flowers, transferring pollen in the process. We all know about the birds and the bees, right? Pollination produces seeds and fruits. Nearly 80% of all flowering plants need the assistance of pollinators to transfer pollen within flowers in order to produce seeds, fruits, and vegetables. More than 30% of food crops depend on insect pollination. Cooperation between growers and the beekeeper is essential. Growers should consider integrated pest management, including all suitable practices, chemicals, cultural, mechanical, biological, genetic, etc., for controlling pests. We all need to eat, and I love to eat. So please, always follow good pesticide stewardship practices. Read and follow all pesticide label directions. Understand local pollinator visitation habits. Strictly observe the applied timing relative to the blooming stage of the crop and other plants in the area. Evening or nighttime applications are generally the least harmful to honeybees and other pollinators that typically forage during the day. Cooperate and communicate with others who are concerned about preserving beneficial insects. Please check for specific local ordinances, especially beehive locations or designated preserves. I like to remind my neighbors that anything sprayed on blooming flowers will most likely end up in the honey I share with them. Together we can be successful. Successful in farming, successful in protecting pollinators. Thank you. <laughs> 